Welcome to the 109th theoretical physics colloquium by Professor Ralph Rapp from uh, Texas A&M University. He received his PhD in 1996 from the University of Bonn. He had uh, two postdoctoral positions at uh, Ulich University and then at Sunny Stony Brook uh, until 1999. Then he became a research assistant, uh, a research scientist and research assistant professor at Stony Brook, moved briefly to uh, be a research assistant professor at Nordita in 2002, and since 2003 he is at Texas A&M University. Over the years he received a number of uh, distinctions and honors. He was for the Linen uh, Fellowship uh, receiver. Uh, uh, spending time at Stony Brook, then he had U.S. National Science Foundation Career Award 2004, Friedrich Wilhelm uh, Basel Research Award from uh, Humboldt Foundation 2007, uh, Robert Heyer Award uh, from Texas Section of the American Physical Society in 2009, and he became a fellow of American Physical Society in 2014. His research interests include theoretical nuclear physics, hadronic physics, um, matter in heavy ion collisions, spectral properties of dense and hot QCD matter, electromagnetic and heavy probes, heavy quark probes in QCD matter, quarconium production, transport, radiation in QCD matter, and many other things. And today he will be talking about electromagnetic radiation probing QCD matter. And with that, I'll give uh, the microphone to Rob. Yeah, Igor, th thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and uh, also for the in in invitation in the first place. It's really my pleasure uh, to share some of the, uh, you know, insights and uh, maybe also struggles that we've gone through uh, over the years uh, on this topic of um, electromagnetic radiation uh, as a probe of QCD matter. And um, I will try to, um, you know, highlight some of the developments uh, and insights also that were um, acquired along the way. So I'll start with, um, with a rather general uh, introduction for a few slides. Um, now my slides won't move. Um, that's bad, I should have tried that, there you go. So um, very generally, um, you know, you all know that uh, QCD has this uh, uh, intriguing, um, property of a rising coupling constant as you go to a small momentum transfer, which uh, on the other hand means uh, the coupling constant becomes small at high energy uh, or high momentum transfer really. And that's where we can really test the theory with high precision and have built the confidence uh, that this is the right theory of the strong interaction. Um, the coupling constant is small, the degrees of freedom are the ones that uh, figure in that uh, famous Lagrangian. And, um, Many phenomena, I think uh, all high energy phenomena are basically um, explained uh, in, in, in this framework. However, things become, uh, let's say, different, more complicated, and may, maybe also more interesting um, at uh, smaller momentum transfer. Um, and now it doesn't work anymore. I'm sorry, something is stuck. Uh, going the wrong direction. Um, so at small momentum transfer, one GV, maybe a little larger squared, we have that transition to strong QC. The coupling becomes uh, large and it becomes actually so large that uh, truly non perturbative phenomena are believed to take over. And they are, in fact, the ones that may be most prominent, uh, the most prominent phenomena in uh, of, of the strong interaction, namely the confinement uh, of color charges leading to new de effective degrees of freedoms, hadrons, uh, and uh, the generation of mass, um, uh, in fact, more than 95% of the visible mass uh, in the universe, um, which uh, we also believe is due to uh, condensate uh, formation. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, later. So um, with such a theory, um, you can not only describe um, or, or the challenge in, in, in the theory is not only describe the, the phenomena in the vacuum, but in particular, a, a very exciting uh, and broadly pursued area is also uh, the study of the uh, uh, matter properties uh, that uh, emerge from the strong interaction. Um, that is usually um, sort of um, epitomized in, uh, in, in the phase diagram of the theory. And uh, I'd say we have uh, some knowledge, but uh, probably there are a lot of uh, phenomena that we don't know about yet. So it's a very exciting area. 
And uh, basically what we expect based on, on general principles that uh, you know, we should melt uh, as we heat and um, excite the vacuum, the, uh, we expect uh, condensates to melt and uh, in that way uh, deconfine uh, the quark and gluon degrees of freedom and also um, degenerate the masses and maybe even dissolve the mass in some way at very high temperatures and chemical potential um, likely um, realized in phase transitions, although it may be not uh, necessarily a, a low order first or second, but rather crossover. Now one very exciting- Can I send a yes. question here? If we look at the big picture here, it's two or three, but not four or five or six quarks. Yes. So, so these, yes, in principle, they are, they are also more complicated. Uh, this is just a sketch. So uh, there could be four quark states. Uh, they, they are usually not that abundant, but they're definitely there, absolutely, yes. And uh, in fact, looking for them in heavy ion collisions is, is, has become a quite uh, hot topic because it may be easier to produce them there than in elementary collisions. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. So indeed, one of the... Um, Mm, very exciting properties uh, or uh, you know exciting um, opportunities is uh, that we can create uh, this matter in the laboratory and uh, basically um, we can do that in, in three contexts we can recreate the matter that we believe last existed 14 billion years ago which, which is really mind-boggling if you think about and that uh, that we can do in these high energy heavy ion collisions uh, basically moving along um, the temperature axis at the very high energy frontier but we can move into the phase diagram at lower collision energies, which is also kind of uh, really exciting. And uh, we, we also have uh, this kind of matter in nowadays, nowadays universe in terms of uh, both neutron stores and uh, more recently also neutron star mergers. And here uh, we are really at the, at the kind of low temperatures for the neutron stars that has been studied for quite a while and um, even predicted um, many years ago, maybe even before, or right around where also quark gluon plasma was uh, expected formulations for that. But uh, when those two uh, neutron stars, when two neutron stars merge, we we actually moving into the temperature plane and 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 can create an overlap with the heavy ion campaigns, and that makes it of course extra exciting. Now the phase diagram has uh, many aspects. Um, you know, you can characterize by transport parameters. Uh, you know, phase changes. Um, uh, and the general question um, that I think uh, I want to in particular also address in this talk and uh, that I think is uh, very important is that we understand the phase structure and the transport properties in terms of the of the underlying interactions uh, from, from, from QCD. Um, so we need probes, we need probes to probe this uh, matter in the in the laboratory. And traditionally, um, uh, the electromagnetic probes have, have really played a, a kind of important role from, from the very beginning when nuclei were discovered. In fact, they contributed to the discovery of nuclei and uh, nuclear substructure uh, in terms of electron or also direct uh, photon uh, scattering experiment. For example, photoabsorption cross-section here, written in terms of this electromagnetic spectral function that I'll come to a, a little later. Nowadays, we can also use photons to produce particles inside nuclei and look for their properties. So these are set, sort of photoproduction uh, experiments and then looking for dileptons in the final state. Again, both uh, in principle penetrating so we can really probe into the nuclei. And then there's a, this really active and, and big area of looking for thermal radiation from the medium that we create in high energy heavy ion collisions really uh, across the board. And uh, this is usually um, categorized in terms of uh, dilepton spectra, and um, which are in a way just uh, you know massive photons which decay into E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus, and direct photons. And in fact, those two probes uh, are very similar. Um, you can calculate the rate. I come back to that a little later. You can calculate the rate of production per unit for volume and for momentum, and it's uh, given in a remarkably uh, simple uh, form. Uh, you have uh, as a, a dynamical ingredient, the electromagnetic speckle function, the strength function really, and you have a thermal distribution function that uh, uh, you know, um, is of course the indicator that you are in the thermal environment and can produce these particles from the thermal energy in, in the bath. And really the only difference is that for dileptons, we have the invariant mass axis while the photon, photon production goes to the uh, zero mass point. In that sense, uh, it's already clear that this invariant mass extra invariant mass uh, variable provides uh, a lot more um, dynamical information 
And uh, however, the experimental price we pay is an extra uh, factor of uh, the fine structure constant. But uh, in fact, our experimentalists uh, know how to deal with that. Okay, so here you see um, um, the electromagnetic spectral function plays a key role. I'll define it more formally in a moment. Let me just show you uh, that uh, we have a very direct measurement of that in the vacuum in terms of this beautiful E plus E minus to hadron cross section divided, say, by the one in mu plus E minus. If you do that, you actually directly uh, end up with this uh, row EM that uh, I highlighted in the previous uh, slide divided by M squared, and you have this uh, really nice um, you know, spectral function, which actually has a lot of features um, that uh, characterize uh, or, or, or are very typical and, and uh, for, for, for QCT. Uh, well, in this yes? Uh, there was a question in the chat window. It asks, in the phase diagram, phase transitions or crossover? Yeah, both probably. So, um, we, we know that at, uh, at mu equals zero, it's a crossover. That I think is pretty solid knowledge uh, from, from lattice QCT. Um, we also have arguments why at high mu, we have a phase transition, first order phase transition, because chances are we're going from one condensate state into another condensate state. Um, you know, that could be different things. Uh, the, you know, it could be a color superconductor. It could be maybe a quarconic phase. But there's a qualitatively different ground state, and that makes it likely there's a first order transition. If that is true, then there should be a first order line and end in a second order. So we may have everything the second order, the first order, and the crossover. And in fact, if there's a second order phase transition endpoint and where it is, that is a very active uh, area of research, in particular also in these low and lower energy campaigns. <clears throat> I hope that answers the question somewhat. Okay. Let's uh, go back to um, what I tried to argue here, how beautiful this spectral function encodes very basic and fundamental properties of QCT uh, at, at the low, you can think of it at Q squared really, invariant mass squared, right? Q squared, for, for momentum Q squared. And uh, at low Q squared, we see how in the vacuum, really that spectral function is dominated by hadrons, in other words, vector mesons in that case, uh, which is massive uh, confined degrees of freedom. So exactly the kind of, um, fantastic phenomena that uh, that uh, characterize QCT in, in, in the vacuum. And the spectral function is essentially proportional uh, to, to those vector meson uh, spectral functions, let's say. On the other hand, if you go to large enough Q squared, we go into a continuum and uh, that continuum receives rather small corrections. In fact, it's a QQ ball continuum. The, the level of the, uh, even the non-interacting continuum here shown in green, it's very close to the data. There are alpha, alpha S corrections. They are not all that large. So, so we are really in the perturbative regime here and we beautifully see how, you know, we have uh, in fact, uh, the number of flavors and number of colors um, re represented by the level of the continuum. Now, what does, uh, what does it offer us for the idea of using this as a probe when we put it into the medium, in particular, let's say in, in a heavy ion collision? Well, if you go to the low mass region and we put this spectral function in the medium or we probe this uh, spectral function in the medium, we can hope to learn about uh, uh, the spectral uh, changes in the spectral shape that may indicate uh, for one, uh, 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 you know, what happens to the hadronic masses. Is there a transition in the degrees of freedom? Is there a restoration of Kyle's, the so-called Kyle's symmetry, which is spontaneously broken? And in fact, if you go to very low mass, um, then uh, we uh, have the phenomenon of a transport peak that gives us the electric conductivity. So really a very rich uh, spectral function uh, that can tell us a lot of things about the medium. And while at high energies, uh, having a continuum, we, 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 we basically have small corrections in, in temperature. So, so that is a basically then um, a stable um, strength function, and we can use it to probe the temperature, which was the second ingredient in, in those uh, rates. So, so really complementary uh, information, we, we can probe the dynamics here, and we can probe the temperature of the medium produced over there. So before going into more detailed uh, calculations, let me just flash, because this is a theoretical colloquium after all, for, for a moment, um, how you would go about calculating the rate. It really starts from, the, there's a dilepton rate in this case. Uh, so the number of pairs per unit for volume, um, it really starts from Fermi's golden rule. Um, uh, and uh, basically you have the, the electromagnetic correlation function and uh, the thermal occupation factors, uh, and also the coupling uh, to the final state dileptons, which is purely uh, um, electromagnetism. 
while all the strong interactions uh, writing this as this uh, correlation functions are fully included in those uh, in those currents. And then you can rearrange uh, things a little bit and uh, you know do some integral you know some variable transformations and arrive at this rate per four volume and per, per four momentum uh, just given in terms of the Bose function of the produced virtual photon and the uh, imag imagine part of that spectral function, which I previously, together with the minus sign, just called rho. So this is its electromagnetic spectral function. Written as this, it's exact in the strong interaction, but of course the challenge is to calculate it uh, um, using, uh, well, in, in, in that medium, using uh, is, you know, strongly, probably strongly coupled um, methods if you really want to go to, to low masses. Um, to begin with, you can just uh, write it down in, in two different bases. In the quark basis, it's just the, you know, the flavor currents here with the charges uh, um, as coefficients uh, representing, yeah, as I said, the, the, the fractional charges of, of the quarks. But you can identically rewrite that um, into, into a form which actually exhibits the isopin uh, content of these quark currents and then group them together. And what you find, you get uh, an isospin one current, which is a rho, an isospin zero non strange current, which is the omega and the strange current, which is the phi. And if you now look at those coefficients and realize that this uh, enters uh, quadratically in the rate, you see the chromosome with a coefficient of one half really dominates over the omega, which is one ninth. So basically it's a factor 10 down and the phi, which is also one ninth. Uh, so, so, so really uh, the chromosome is a key player here if you uh, attack this problem from the, from the hadronic side. And with that, um, I have... Uh, you know, organize the rest of my talk into basically four sections, let's say. Um, I'll discuss calculations of the in medium spectral function, both hadronic and, uh, and quark, and uh, what that already tells us without even comparing to experiment to begin with. But then we, of course, want to compare to experiment and see, uh, test our theory and refine it, um, get information on the spectral shape and fireball properties. Uh, and, and then I will come to the, to the question of chiral symmetry restoration which was one of the original ideas, um, in fact, to look at what happens to the chromosome in the medium. And it turned out maybe a little different than we originally uh, expected. And I tried to, uh, you know, try to highlight that, um, what the current understanding is. And finally, uh, come back to that uh, very low uh, mass, uh, even zero mass limit uh, related to the conductivity, which has recently picked up quite some uh, activity and uh, our experimental friends are actually confident they can uh, do it uh, quite soon. So very exciting developments also there. All right, let's start with the spectral function. Let's start with the hadronic basis. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on the chromosome. So you write down an effective Lagrangian for, for the rho pi interactions. Uh, you have to make it uh, gauge invariant. After all, you have a vector current. You want it conserved. Uh, so you get these two contributions, the rho to pi pi decay. And you need this extra uh, tetrapod term, uh, as I said, to con have a conserved current. Um, you can then use uh, uh, these diagrams to calculate uh, the self-energy in the vacuum, uh, which has both real and imaginary part. Um, and then in uh, the vector dominance model that I indicated earlier, you can then calculate also observables like the pion electromagnetic form factor and the pi pi phase shifts. And those are, in fact, the ones that then allow you to um, constrain the coupling constant, uh, the bare mass, you know, which gets corrections from a real part here as well as some cutoff scale that uh, with which you have to um, you know, um, regularize uh, those, those integrals, those parameters here written explicitly. And you can get a pretty good description uh, of those, uh, of those uh, you know, experimentally accessible uh, quantities, form factor and phase shifts. Okay, so that's a good starting point. And then, um, and that has been long for, known for a long time. Uh, but uh, now, uh, you know, you want to implement that into the medium and ask uh, what happens to if I inject the raw into a hadronic medium, how does uh, its, how do its spectral properties change or how does its propagator change? So what uh, that amounts to is having to calculate this in medium self energies using, you know, thermal field theory or hadronic many body theory, however you want to call it. And there are in principle two types of uh, contributions that you pick up. Um, historically, the first one was that you uh, address uh, the pions in the vacuum pion cloud and also in that tadpole. And we refer to that to the in medium pion cloud. You know, the pions can interact, say, with the nucleons, excite into deltas, or it can collide with other pions in the heat bath. And you calculate pion self energies. That, uh, that uh, makes it necessary to actually calculate vertex corrections. And that has been 
subsequently worked out over say a decade or so and more and more refined and um, um, yeah that is the pion cloud uh, contribution but uh, it has also been realized that the Robinson can directly interact with hadrons from the heat bath nucleons pions cairns even resonances to excite other resonances so this is resonance physics of the row on hadrons and uh, you know there can be all kinds of resonances and indeed if you look in the particle data book that there are states like for example the N1520 which has about a 20% chance of decaying N rho although it's well below threshold which tells you really it has a very large coupling similarly the A1 the classic rho pi uh, resonance you can have a rho k resonance so on and so forth so that has been realized and then also systematically worked out over the years now the whole point here is that you want to get um, an estimate of your in medium row propagator or spectral function that you with which you calculate the hadronic rate. You want to have an estimate or, or some theoretical control at least over it before you go into the heavy ion uh, environment, so that you can have sort of controlled tests of uh, your ideas of how this propagator looks like. So really, the key, um, mm, let's say, the key. Um, uh, task here is to to uh, constrain um, the parameters of the effective hadronic vertices and uh, you can do it of course directly through uh, the decays of the resonances and you have both hadronic and um, um, radiated decays at your disposal so you also have information on the momentum dependence of these effective vertices and you can also look at least for uh, nuclear uh, targets and nuclear targets, uh, look at scattering data like pi n to rho n or gamma absorption spectra. And I'm going to give you just one example here, which is the photoabsorption that I in fact mentioned already. So this is on the nucleon, so sort of the vacuum. And you see there is this pi n cloud contribution and then there are the resonances. And in fact, uh, experimentally it's known what that decomposition is and, and uh, you know this pi n cloud contribution is roughly at 80 microbarn experimentally, and that's also helps you, um, you know, constrain parameters. And then you have the prevalent resonances, uh, the first, second, and third resonance region. It's not 100% unique, although we have uh, recent data from Hades which uh, made a lot better uh, distinction what these resonances are. But but for in large, by and large, uh, it's important that you have. The strength in these functions because that will give you uh, you know the strength of the self energies you can also uh, infer medium effects in fact the that is known from the absorption on nuclei and uh, while the delta survives actually higher resonances melt so you can already get information on also the medium widths and masses on these particles which further helps you to to constrain uh, the effective vertices that you have in your new effective theory Okay, so maybe one slide, uh, what kind of, how these different uh, self energy contributions ultimately lead to dielectron or photon production uh, rates. So, so here I draw one phase, not phase diagram, one self energy diagram where the row interacts with the nucleon, makes a baryon resonance, and then that baryon resonance in principle can decay. Also, it has a width, and uh, you couple it to the photon, you cut it through, that's the imaginary part, and you start generating things like the Dalit's decays of the resonances. Or the pi n uh, t channel scattering, which is a sort of this uh, pine cloud um, smooth background term. Or, uh, you know, you can have uh, uh, density squared correction from, say, pions or nucleons, which generates Bremsstrahl. So, so these are the kind of process, and there are a lot of them um, in, in this way of doing things. And, uh, you know, it turns out, uh, you know, you probably need all of them and have some control over that along the ways uh, I, I said. Ralph, I yes. quick clarifying question. Uh, since you are working with the hadronic degrees of freedom, it assumes that you have a rather low temperature. Is that right? Okay. That's exactly anticipating my uh, next, uh, almost next slide. I'll come to the quark gluon degrees of freedom in just a second. Okay. Yes, but it, absolutely right. Um, we, this is uh, valid in the in the hadronic phase. Yes, absolutely right. You, uh, you're fully with me with the logic here. <clears throat> yes. And uh, yeah, let's look at spectral functions uh, or, or raw spectral functions that sort of emerge uh, from this. Here I've taken an example where the chemical potential is pretty high, actually, sort of for what you have at uh, the old SPS running 20 GV root S. Uh, in fact, rig beam energy scan also uh, going back into that regime even higher, even higher. And you see as you increase temperature and, and as baryon density increases, uh, this vacuum raw uh, resonance really broadens it doesn't move much it doesn't move all that much but it very much broadens and uh, all these interactions 
essentially wipe it out. So the widths here become of the order of the mass itself. So there is, if you if you believe that uh, you can extrapolate it to 180 MeV, um, it suggests the Rome is on uh, melts. You know, it uh, it really does. does. And then you ask, you know, what are the dominant contributions uh, here? And it turns out the dominant contributions are actually variants. And this is illustrated here. If I just switch off all the contributions from variants, but do otherwise the exact same calculation, keep all the meson interactions in the gas, uh, there's not much happening. Not all that much happening here. There's a little bit of the quenching, but it's nowhere near as extreme as you have with the baryons. So the baryons really seem to be the, the agent here uh, of, of uh, the melting. And that remains true, actually, at high energies, RIC and LHC, uh, because while you do have a very small net baryon density, you have both rather abundant nucleons and anti-nucleons, or baryons and anti-baryons, and the row picks up as equally well a baryon or an anti-baryon. It's sensitive to the sum of baryon and anti-baryons. And there also you say, see substantial broadening, although it's a little less pronounced, and that can be tested, of course, uh, in the experiment, if that is true. OK, so now I come to the quark-based uh, uh, calculations. And here, uh, I'm so happy Rob Bisoski is here, because I can, you know, I had this, uh, didn't expect it, but I had this uh, you know, pioneering uh, calculation here uh, discussed um, in the so-called hot thermal loop uh, perturbation theory. Um, I mean, you can do the leading order, and then it's just uh, what I discussed before, showed before that continuum. But you want to do better, and that's what these gentlemen did, to fully respect engaged environment and organizing your uh, vertices and uh, in medium corrections in that way. And basically, at the end, what you what you generate are, are, are um, diagrams that uh, you know at the at the Phase value uh, look quite similar to to the hadronic diagrams, but now of course with quark gluon degrees of freedom here, kind of you know dull. It's kind of the case, although this is of course not really a resonance, but you know here uh, scattering diagrams and then also Bramstrahlung and so on. Ralph, you, yes. Another question from Scott Pratt. Why do you refer to it as melting? That's the previous slide, I assume. Yes. Looks like collision broadening. Yeah, it's an extreme form of collision broadening that is so large that the width of the particle becomes comparable to its mass. So yeah, it's collisional broaden, uh, but it uh, it uh, kills the resonance, you know, it kills the resonance. And we can discuss, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Uh, you know, it's an, you know, you, I'm not going to say that I 100% trust this calculation because it is at relatively high densities. Um, but, uh, you know, I would trust this 150, you know, and then uh, it's just a matter of what uh, keeps uh, going. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and I uh, will show that uh, what I think what we have to do, we have to match uh, the hadronic uh, bottom up uh, description with the uh, quark gluon uh, top down description, right? And that will be indeed almost next slide. So let me just dis finish discussion here of the of the quark based rates. Um, you know, here here's just the vanilla Born term. Uh, then you have this HDL. It uh, through these soft processes, it gives this divergence here, which it should. Um, because you have the soft photon propagators as you go lower and lower in mass or energy. And uh, it, it actually agrees pretty well, even at that uh, level, uh, with uh, unquen with quenched, quenched lattice data. And uh, this is, I think, still remains true. This still may, remains true. This is a little older, but I think this still remains true. So it's really um, uh, the many body effects are really these, uh, this enhancement. And uh, now we can compare. Now we can compare the rates, uh, do this bottom up and top down comparison of the hadronic and QGP based calculations of the rates in this case, right? So the rates here, uh, I, you know, per unit for volume, that's okay, that's a local rate, but then we integrate it for simplicity over momentum. So we get a rate as a function of invariant mass and the key element here, the spectral function, both from the hadronic and the QGP side. And let me walk you uh, uh, quickly through this, uh, through what we see here for the rate. Um, so, so, so the, the green one is if you use the vacuum spectral function in um, in hadronic degrees of freedom, it's just reflecting the raw resonance, this deep region, and the transition to the QG bore. If you do the alpha s, the the non-interacting calculation for uh, the the quarks, we have this vanilla, uh, you know, just QQ bore non-interacting continuum. Um, now we uh, switch on medium effects in hadronic gas. We broaden the raw. We get the low mass tails from the soft processes, and we get also this uh, many body effects from the QGP. And if you go to 180 MeV, you know, here you could say, why should I trust the QGP at such small temperatures? And yeah, you can make that argument, but you go higher, uh, you know, the QGP becomes uh, more trustworthy at some point. But the nice thing is that uh, for um, 
you know, for reasons which I cannot make rigorous, but uh, at least uh, show as an evidence, these rates seem to have in the overlap region, seem to overlap as, as simple as that. So that's, uh, that's, um, that's uh, reassuring because it, uh, it allows us to make a, a switching, if you wish, from the hadronic to the uh, QGP rates uh, without, uh, you know, without uh, any jumps in, in, the, in the description. And that I think is, uh, is, is a nice thing that we, you know, that was unraveled sort of uh, in, in the late 90s and early 2000s in particular. So res raw resonance melts in that uh, sense. The spectral function of hadronic spectral function merges, it seems, in the, in the partonic continuum. So I would argue this is actually direct evidence or realization of a, of a transition from, from hadronic degrees of freedom here, the Robinson, into a structureless QQ bore continuum with important effects, of course, from the medium in both calculations from these soft processes. So, um, you know, here I show that again from the letters, but this is basically the same. You can look under the hood again for the hadronic calculation here, slightly different um, conditions. Um, so this is the total. And basically the, the three kind of contributions, the pion cloud, the rho resonance, uh, rho nucleon resonance and rho meson resonance, they all more or less contribute on equal footing. If anything, the mesonic piece is, is the smallest, as I argued before, especially also here in the peak region. Uh, but the, all three of them, uh, you know, contribute uh, their share. So, uh, you know, the, the effort sort of in, in trying to include all of them uh, really uh, in a way worthwhile because uh, you need, uh, you know, you may want to need all of them. Okay, so that, that sets up uh, the rates that we can now use to uh, calculate uh, the lepton emission in heavy ion collisions. So what we need to do so we need to take those rates as function of temperature and chemical potential and implement them into a realistic space-time evolution um, of a heavy ion collision. Ideally, that would be uh, a non-ideal hydro, really, and uh, say the hard hydros, and that, that has been done. And uh, let me just guide through what kind of sources we have other than the thermal radiation. Well, we have the drill yan on the upon initial contact um, of the nuclei. That is really at a rather high masses above, that kicks in, I'd say, above 2 GV or so in mass. We have the QGP radiation, uh, we have the hadronic radiation, that's what I just discussed. And then we also have final state decays of all these hadrons, sometimes really long-lived uh, radiative decays like pion or eta dalitz decays at high invariant masses, also what we call the correlated charm or bottom decay. So these are all physical sources, uh, but of course, the interesting one that we are after are the, are the thermal radiation. Now you convolute that over uh, space-time evolution, and uh, that has been done by many groups. And for for all the beautiful data that we have, all the way here from the low energies at Hades, all the way uh, you know via SPS energies that were among the first ones. Also here, SPS energies, Phoenix data at, at the high root s, and then this beautiful store excitation function all the way from the 19 GeV, which matches to that one, which is 17. We have 27, 39, 62, all the way to the 200, which uh, agrees with the Phoenix data. The star data were first, the Phoenix data came a little later in this form, but now they also agree, which is always good to, to have, you know, redundancy in the experiment. There was some discrepancy, but it was resolved eventually. And uh, I would say there's a really a reasonably robust description now of um, the leptin spectra as far as, we, as, as, far as uh, they have been measured, beautiful data here. Uh, with this, uh, with this, um, with this uh, ansatz of a rate that um, you know it has a QGP contribution and a hadronic contribution, and of course at the low energies the hadronic contribution will be larger, while at higher energies also the QGP comes in. In fact, the QGP dominates at some point, at the, especially at higher invariant masses. Um, and so you see here also at the, at the highest energies, then QGP and hadronic even become very comparable except in the resonance region. So, so, so there, is a, there, there is this, um, I think, rather robust uh, description uh, as of now of these uh, observables. Let's have a little look, uh, a little closer look with the sort of the, uh, the gold standard in dileptons. In fact, this one is different from all the others because it has the initial state Drelyan and the final state long-lived uh, Dalitz decay subtracted. So, so the data here have subtracted these initial and long-lived sources. So we are really looking at the thermal radiation, which is of course a theorist dream that you can don't have to worry about those. And you can just look at the thermal radiation. And um, 
again, what you do is you, you take your rates, you integrate them over space, time, volume, QGP, hadronic matter, do the expansion as realistic as you can. And then you get this picture here. And this is really very, uh, very nice picture. Um, because it it, re, it it kind of realizes already um, what I promised on one of the earlier slides. We see here that uh, the raw peak is really very much uh, quenched. The raw peak is quenched. You get these low mass tails. Uh, so this is now calculated with the spectral functions I discussed earlier. Um, there, there's little raw peak. Uh, so it's, of course, a space-time average, but, but uh, this large quenching and the transition to QGP is underlying these calculations, and it seems to work uh, reasonably well. On the other hand, even at these relatively low SPS energies, I should have written yeah, here, root S of uh, 17, um, there, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we get a QGP, mostly QGP uh, radiation at higher masses, and there I advertised that uh, you know, we can prop the temperature because we have good control over the spectral shape, and indeed, what came out is uh, that the average temperature that we're probing here from this QGP radiation is about 200 MeV. And that really applies that in the calculation, you have to go to high, relatively high initial temperatures for SPS, somewhat maybe unexpected, of already 235 uh, MeV. Uh, STAR is producing now also similar kind of data. And uh, there are, again, very interesting features going on, both uh, in the low mass region and the high mass region. What I would argue, though, based on what I discussed in, in the context of the lepton rates, that uh, this is a rather direct uh, evidence, although not really quantified at this point, uh, of, of the melting of the row and the transition from the average of the hadronic to the QGP radiation, transition really in degrees of freedom. And this is further corroborated by the explicit temperature measurement at which the same spectrum is populated just at higher invariant masses. So I think that's... Um, yeah, that was a great achievement from the NN60 collaboration. And uh, we hope that uh, future experiments will, will, and we are confident, will follow up on that, actually. Just uh, to demonstrate uh, um, the sensitivity to the speckled shape, I've shown here how the width of the chromosome, um, you know, just reading it off, if you wish, from those uh, speckled functions I showed, how that develops as a function of temperature. Let's uh, concentrate you on the red curve, which goes into the calculation. You see, if you go at very high temperatures, you extrapolate it here, it, uh, the raw width becomes 6, 700 MeV, and uh, that, that, that is comparable to the mass. And, and quantum mechanically, that is what thing, right? If the state, uh, if the width is uh, of the order of the mass, then it, uh, you know, the state is, is, uh, ceases, ceases to exist. Uh, you can ask, what is the average width figuring in the calculation? It's still about 370 at 150. So that's a, that's a in medium width of about 230 or 40 MeV, the vacuum width is around 130, 140. So you take that out, it's still in medium width on average, uh, well above 200 MeV. And what that means really is that the, the interaction energy encoded in that width is very comparable, if not larger than the kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy for a non-relativistic state, three half KT at 150, that's 225. So really kinetic energy and uh, interaction energy are comparable, if not larger, at the higher temperatures. And I would argue that, uh, that this indicates, in fact, that the hadronic medium um, at the high temperatures is also liquid. And that, that is good news because, uh, you know, after all, we do have a crossover and there's no reason why uh, once you go into the hadronic system, you immediately jump into a gas uh, from the QGP, which close to TC is, is very strongly coupled. Um, here is the demonstration what happens uh, if you switch off baryons and under baryons in the calculation, much like what I did for the short for the spectral function. You see, if you only operate with the mesonic uh, medium, uh, there's no way that you neither get the quenching of the peak nor the uh, low mass enhancement. Even the QGP helps, but it's not enough. You, you really need this very large uh, strong broadening. So, so in a way, this purple calculation is the one that corresponds to widths that are uh, with this uh, no baryon uh, scenario. And uh, you know you see how sensitive you are about large factors, especially in the low mass uh, enhancement. So you really need the baryons and we really are sensitive to these large, uh, in the, the lepton spectra do tell us that we need those large widths in the hadronic phase also. Okay, good. So um, let's now come to a bit more of theoretical uh, considerations. Uh, um, I already argued that uh, you know we have liquid um, in the hadronic system, which matches onto the QGP. We have uh, evidence for degrees of freedom. What about this question of power restoration that I also mentioned earlier? 
So we have to make a, a, a connection to Carl order parameter. So let's first do that uh, in, in, in the vacuum and understand what Carl symmetry breaking means there. It actually doesn't mean mass generation per se, it means mass splitting in the Carl multiplex, right? Uh, we have Carl partners like pi sigma, rho A1, nucleon and uh, nucleon minus, right? The excited state. And it's a mass splitting in these Carl multiplets that signifies chiral restoration, chiral symmetry breaking in the vacuum. And you know, that is, uh, that is characterized by, if you wish, uh, a rotation, chiral rotation, which means S-wave pines. We also have the resonance excitation, so the P-wave pines and the P-wave, uh, you know, making strong resonances in the spectrum. Uh, but, but the chiral part of it is really these S-wave pion uh, interactions. So um, that is, of course, well known. And um, in particular for the case at hand, the row A1, um, which we're interested in, there's a beautiful set of so-called Weinberg summaries, pre-QCD, obviously, which quantify the difference in the vector and the axial vector, if you wish, the row and the axial meson um, spectral functions um, integrated over the whole region in S. So you integrate the difference in the spectral function and what you end up with is Carl order parameters. So here F pi or pi and radius, right? That's the existence of the pi and axial constant, pi and decay constant, core condensate, four core condensate. Okay, not that well known, but you can try to model it uh, with, uh, you know, let me not go into that. Basically, you have the connection to Carl restoration by these Carl Weinberg sum rules. And in fact, you can also, re-derive and re-express them in QCD sum rules for those channels individually. So they are not even quite independent in any case. Um, so this is what you have. The difference in the Carl partners integrated gives you the Carl order parameters. So you can first do uh, this analysis of the sum rules in the vacuum and see if you can satisfy them. Uh, so you take your row, you, you, you have to include the row prime, you know, you want to uh, integrate over whole S region. You do the A1. Um, and well, okay, you go into a continuum. The continuum is supposed to be Carly symmetric. So that should be the same for the two, even in the vacuum, right? That's a high energy continuum. Here you have the row prime on top and uh, what turns out, so these are beautiful uh, tau decay data for, for the vector and the axial vector. So basically in the two and four pines here in the three uh, and five pines. So you have these very precise data, which unfortunately end at the tau mass, right? Uh, square root of three. Um, so how do these sum rules really look like if you say um, stop uh, more or less here at the, at the, at the Thomas? And this is shown how, say, the first Weinberg sum rule one, which is this, is f pi squared here, right? Uh, you first pick up, um, you first pick up, uh, you start at zero, then you first integrate the row peak, it becomes very positive. Then you integrate the A1, it becomes negative. Then you uh, do the row prime peak. And if that's all there is, you would end up here, right? Um, Turns out you already have indications that uh, you know there's something else. Let's call it a prime, a one prime. And if you include that one, then you can get the summer will work out quantitatively. It becomes more extreme if you take a higher moment for this summer will. I call it summer will two. You first get the row peak, you get the a one peak, you get the row prime peak. But if you don't do anything else but the row prime, you're way off really. Only if you again include the A1 prime peak, you get it back down. So I would argue that in the, even in the vacuum already, these sum rules are really sensitive to, to the spectral properties uh, of the Carl partners. Uh, we kind of predicted from this, uh, this, this A1 prime. You look in the particle data booklet, there's something like that there, but uh, you know, I find it, found it remarkable how these sum rules are really sensitive to the spectral shape. Now you go uh, in, in, in the medium. Now you go in the medium. What's the strategy here? Um, we don't have this beautiful data. We do have information on the in-medium vector, right? So our strategy one was then use the in-medium spectral function as we, you know, calculated and which did a good job, let's say, uh, in experiment. Um, use lattice QCD for the order parameters on the right-hand side. So use lattice QCD as much as possible uh, on, on the right-hand side. And then try to, try to construct I, your lattice data for the four condensate, for example, try to reconstruct or try to find an A1 spectral function that satisfies these sum rules, temperature by temperature and, uh, you know, sum rule by sum rule. And uh, that was not an easy task, but Paul Hüller actually did it. And, uh, you know, you get Carl restoration more or less at 170 here, right? That's, that's not maybe surprising, but the gradual 
development. That is uh, the challenge here, and that's uh, what Paul really uh, did. And once you once you buy that, and as I said, it's it's not it's not uh, over it's it's quite over constrained actually. And then we can see what happens to the A1 speckle function. And, and what happens is that the A1 mass, the A1 drops, I mean, broadens, but uh, you know, at zero chemical potential, which this is, there's some remnant peak of the row even at 170, and the A1 has to degenerate with that. So the A1 mass, if you wish, the A1 mass drops. Or another way of saying uh, the mass splitting burns off while the ground state mass persists. So this is what we now would say. This is uh, the, the the mechanism for chiral restoration, uh, as far as we can see from here. The the mass splitting burns off while the ground state mass persists. Um, turns out there's a similar, uh, totally different um, uh, insight from lattice QCD that has a, has the same mechanism. In fact, this is a very nice lattice data from the Swansea group, Gerard et al. And they looked at nucleon and uh, N minus, so chiral partner of the nucleon, um, Euclidean correlator. These are actually, uh, yeah, correlator ratios. Normalized. Actually, this is a correlator just normalized. It's not a ratio, it's a correlator normalized to the one and zero. So these are really the correlators. You see the vacuum here, the slope, as, as you probably know, as many of you know, the, the slope gives you the, uh, the, the high energy, the high tau slope gives you essentially the mass. So that's the nucleon mass. Uh, this holds of mass. Uh, much uh, quicker. That's the N-store mass here in the lattice that is extracted in the vacuum at low temperature. Okay, nucleon mass 1.2 GV. It's a little high, but you know, pion mass is still significant here. Not exactly in the current limit yet for 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 the quark masses. Uh, and minus mass is 1900. Again, a bit high, but uh, it has a basic feature here. And and then you go to higher and higher temperature, and at the end of the day, you go to 1.9. Actually, they are degenerate. Um, but how does it really uh, look like in terms of the mass that you try to extract from these correlators? And, and what you find is that um, um, the, the ground state mass more or less stays constant, while the uh, excited state, the n star 1535, the n1 half minus mass, actually drops down. So, so this is exactly, I would argue, this is exactly the kind of same mechanism that the ground state mass stays stable, well, in the nucleon, for the nucleon doublet, right? Nucleon and its chiral partner, and the excited state drops drops down. So ground state mass drops down, chiral splitting burns off. You can even quantify that better in terms of uh, uh, minus versus plus integrated, and you see uh, that basically tracks uh, the the chiral condensate, right? And it's realized by it seems a very similar mechanism. And we have other uh, examples. In fact, the, the good old pi sigma is, is another example of that. The pi is protected. The sigma has to come down in a way, right? At least if it's a crossover or a, a weak, uh, you know, second order, the, the, pi, the pi stays as a Goldstone boson. The sigma has to come down. So you could add, in fact, the pi sigma uh, to the list. So that is, I would say, that what we over the last, you know, five, five to 10 years, we have, uh, we think we have learned about what could be a mechanism of color restoration, the burning of the mass splitting. So how many minutes do you still give me? Like five, five, six or so? Well, it's fine. Yeah, either way. Okay. So last thing is the conductivity, very low mass. Um, no, you, one basic idea is that the conductivity is actually a transport parameter on the same footing than let's say eta over S or say heavy quark diffusion coefficient. In some units, you know, here written such uh, that these two objects actually become one uh, in the strong coupling limit. But that's not so important. The point I want to make here is that you, you are in a medium and uh, it's the same medium whether you transport charge, whether you transport energy momentum or whether you transport flavor uh, quantum numbers, right? It's the same medium. So these transport coefficients should be some, somehow related, right? And it's great to have uh, another one in terms of the conductivity. You can calculate in kinetic theory, no problem with, uh, you know, relaxation times and densities and charge of the different carriers, but you can also do it in the quantum field theory from the zero energy limit of the zero momentum spectral function, right? That same spectral function that we use for the dileptons divided by Q0, I mean, it's a, it's a bosonic spectral function goes to zero, but you divide it by Q0, you get a finite value at Q0, and that's really the conductivity. And uh, let's look what, uh, what is known about that uh, as of, let's say, five years ago or so. Um, so, so this is conductivity over T from different approaches. So this is a, this is a, a kinetic theory calculation from the work by uh, Frankfurt Group, I think, Greif et al. 
there's a um, you know there's a calculation from a pattern cascade perturbative pattern cascade is pretty high. Uh, then their lattice state, uh, they, they are pretty low. Um, then there's a uh, super young males, uh, which is constant here. You do a non holographic, non conformal holographic uh, model, uh, you know, follows lattice data better. You do car perturbation theory. It's, it's also very small. I mean, basically, it's, uh, it's uh, I'd say, uh, unfortunately, sort of uh, all over the place, right? Factor 10. Um, just to show that uh, you can extract the conductivity peak, I show you the, the very nice result of uh, Moore Robert um, from the H, based on the HTL, um, uh, where you uh, plot the spectral, basically the spectral function divided by Q0, and you see the conductivity peak. And as alpha s increases, the peak comes down. So conductivity goes down, which means stronger coupled, which is exactly what you're doing. But it's a pretty sharp peak. It's a pretty sharp peak. And that's, in a way, what you expect from perturbation theory. If you take those values, put them on diagram, it's, it's up here. Not so far from the perturbative Horton cascade, really. So question is, what can we do now from, from um, how can we put it in the context of what I discussed? And I'm going to focus here on, on the hadronic side for now. So one of the main ingredients was this pion cloud contribution, and it's, it's a loop integral over two pion propagators. And you know, if you have the row decay into pi pi in, in the vacuum, you get these, uh, you know, you never really uh, populating invariant masses very low. What you what you pick up though uh, from the field theory, from the thermal field theory is a, sometimes called the Landau cut or the, the zero mode where you turn one pion around, you turn one pion around and don't have a decay into two pions, but one pion becomes incoming. One of the pines becomes incoming. Um, it's still the same uh, loop, but you get it out of this Matsubara sum, where one pine can become incoming, a scatter, and emit a photon. Now, you need the self energies to populate the zero uh, energy um, peak. But if you resolve the energy, say, in terms of the underlying uh, self energies, pi pi scattering amplitudes, right? Uh, integrate over the medium and cut the lines open, you see actually uh, what these are are just, you know, in this case, final state Bramstrahlung or initial state Bramstrahlung. So you get the pi pi Bramstrahlung out of this Lando cut or zero mode that people sometimes call it from the from the Matsubara sum at final temperature. So that's great. And, uh, you know, because that's what you need if you if you want to do the conductivity. Um, and we didn't actually have it in um, in the calculations that they had before. And because we were never really sensitive, but now we had it in actually for the variance, but not for the pion cloud. And uh, now we also uh, took a closer look at what happens in the pion cloud. Don't want to go to too much detail. You do have, so if you do a careful uh, analysis of this very low energy region and do your Landau cut uh, properly, you, you do see the conductivity peak coming up here. This is at one MeV uh, as a function of energy. Let me just say, if you go to 300 MeV, typical thermal momentum, the conductivity peak is completely gone. So, so really you need to go to very low momentum to see that conductivity peak. That's maybe the main, main point I want to make here. Um, that's a challenge for experiment, but I'll come back to that in just a minute. Here now, um, uh, blown up for in low energy region, again, for this very small momentum, one MeV, and that's probably why there's a little bit of a distortion here. But bottom line here is, let's look at these solid lines. This is what I get out of the uh, spectral function that uh, we used thus far. Um, and the conductivity peak is actually pretty high. Uh, it's pretty high. The variants seem not to be very effective in lowering the conductivity, but the pions are. So you include the pion width from the pi pi rescattering, the pi pi branch line, those really knock down the conductivity peak. So bottom line here is, it seems that the, the physics of the conductivity peak in hadronic matter um, is, is governed by the light by the light carriers, pions and cairns. And that's not, maybe not surprising. Those are the, you know, those carry charge much easier than the variance, while at the at, at around the raw peak, it's really the variance which are the catalyst of uh, uh, the melting. You can put then, you know, these these values here in the diagram. So if you just do the variance, it's actually way up here. If you include the pions, it comes down. Yeah, we we clearly need more work. The pions will pull it further down, maybe eight and so on. So there's more room to be done here. Uh, more room for work to be done here that we pro hopefully would get uh, even a little lower here, maybe close. We should in principle uh, be able to get close to the kinetic uh, theory result. And um, then the question is, you know, can we probe it in experiment? And that's sort of my last slide. Here uh, again, I zoom in, completely zoom in to the very low mass, not very, yeah, well, 300 MeV, right? Low mass region of the dileptons and uh, um, look at uh, different scenarios. Um, 
So here, here's the here's the, if you don't have pions in there, that's a that's a purple line, relatively small, or large conductivity, but you don't see the conductivity. It's an integral over momentum. So actually, these are momentum integrated. What you only see is is the is is the the broadening of the peak. So in other words, what I'm saying is, uh, what you see is the broadening of the peak here, right? You don't see the intercept because it uh, experiment will be momentum integrated. And it's a it's a tail which which you can see experimentally, and you have quite good sensitivity here, but you're not going to be able to uh, as, uh, find the intercept. So you're only going to indirectly measure the conductivity through the peak broadening. You can improve your sensitivity a lot if you make a very low PT cut, say 30 MeV. You know, then uh, you that uh, that broadening comes out much better, um, and uh, there there are large. Then you have large sensitivity to to the tails here of the of the conductivity peak. In principle, and uh, you know that can be done maybe soon, e even in the low energy experiments. How this, um, and it will be done uh, also in the future at the at uh, at LHC. There are plans to do that uh, eventually, not very soon, but eventually. So that uh, wraps up my talk, and um, uh, I would phrase my uh, what I try to uh, tell you here: uh, a tale of uh, three peaks, or you could say a tale of three tails of the peaks. <clears throat> Uh, in medium row spectral function, low mass dileptons, uh, I argued the row is strongly broadened, um, so so strongly that the interaction energy exceeds the kinetic energy. So that's a liquid criterion. The, the, so strongly that if you extrapolate it a little higher, then maybe the calculations are reliable. You find the melting suggested for a hadron true proton transition. The in medium A1 spectral function that tells us about chiral restoration. What we seem to be finding that chiral restoration for the examples we, we could evaluate thus far, rho A1, but also nucleon, nucleon star, pi and sigma, that what happens is not that the mass goes away per se, but the mass splitting, which is the chiral breaking, that is burning off while the ground state mass probably comes from somewhere else. I would say gluon condensate, but I don't want to uh, you know, speculate too much. Uh, maybe a little teaser. And then there's the third peak uh, from the row to the A1 to the third peak, the very low mass conductivity peak. We're not going to see the conductivity itself, but we probably be reasonably sensitive to it, to the broadening again, to the conductivity peak that will allow us to constrain uh, the intercept, in other words, the sigma. Okay, so th thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for going a little over time here. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Now we will have some time for questions. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand and I'll call in the order of the hands appearing. Uh, to break the ice, let me ask the question um, related to the NA60 experiment. Yeah. You were basically assuming that there will be a quark gluon plasma initially with the temperature of order 235. That seems like very high and good uh, yeah. quark gluon plasma. Yeah. Is there a weak point of that assumption? What what are we, what am I missing? Yeah, so there could be a weak point indeed. I, I'm still uncomfortable with that temperature because how do you get the large temperature? You need very fast thermalization, you know. And uh, how do you get very fast thermalization? You, you you have this thermalization time, right? That also enters in every hydro calculation unless you do something pre equilibrium. But in the standard hydro. You need to choose a, a thermalization time, which amounts to the thickness, basically, when the nuclei overlap, how quick that happens. And here, basically, the thickness is very close to, if not even a little smaller, uh, than the pure geometric overlap for the, for the pancakes that you have at these energies. So it's extremely quick. And uh, that makes me still a little uncomfortable. But I think, um, based on what uh, recent work done by people in uh, Bielefeld, I think also Strickman et al., they calculate a, a, a so-called pre-equilibrium contribution that uh, that should be there, and it's uh, you know at LHC and at uh, uh, Rick Energies, it's not small. Uh, at least in, uh, even in that relatively low mass region, the, the pre-equilibrium will be even harder. Will be even harder, and um, I think at Rick and LHC, it's it's definitely uh, plays a role at two GV. I think it also will play a little bit of a role here. In fact, it fit, fits the bill perfectly. Uh, in a way, because if you look very closely, even that slope, you know, gets a little too soft here and uh, we starting, you know, I mean, experimentalists told us maybe not too much of a concern here, but, you know, if as a naive theorist look at this, I, I still see that the slope is a little, little too soft even. And uh, I think, and we, we started discussing that, in fact, with Lern Schlichting 
uh, try to evaluate uh, a pre-equilibrium contribution. And I think that will ease somewhat of the um, of our mind here uh, when hopefully, you know, if that becomes significant. I see, I see. A very good so, question though. So the idea would be that essentially this pre-equilibrium distribution would be different from thermal and of course from the tails of the distribution or from the tails of this uh, access radiation spectrum, you might be able even to distinguish between true equilibrium and let's say pre-equilibrium. Yes, yes. so, so the combination of those, you know, the idea would be that hope or the hope would be there's a pre-equilibrium, which is in a way power law, right? Because it's uh, it's it's not thermalized yet. Right. It will be much harder. Uh, how large it is, we don't know, but if it's much harder, if it's harder and uh, contributes a, a bit of a yield here, we can probably ease up on that uh, on that temperature a little bit. <laughs> I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Scott, please go ahead. Um, yeah, Rolf, I have something that I, uh, about the chiral symmetry res restoration and a couple of questions. And the first one is the A1, is that a pseudo vector? And, uh, yes. And one plus. So how do you yes. see, can you see that in medium very easily with no, we don't see that at all. In the and medium. also, so you talk about it's, it's, uh, I just wanted to be sure. So, even though it, you said the signal is that it's that it's a spectral function changes, you don't have a good experimental handle on it. Is that correct, or uh, how basically no it? experimental handle thus far? Yes. Oh, so okay. It's, it's a it's a it's a you see. So this is the vacuum. You can generalize the sum rules to the me medium that was done by Kapusta Shurek in a very nice paper. And then the strategy is we input the row v from what we learned from experiment or you know our hydronic calculation or whatever. We take the right hand side, the temperature depends from lattice, and then we try yeah. to find the spectral function theoretically that okay. satisfies those sum rules as a function of temperature. And that's the red lines here. Okay, good. And then the second question I have this is a little bit almost just a tiny bit off topic, but the uh, again with the chiral symmetry, there are these different paradigms from way back when I used to pay more yes. attention to this in right. the 90s or so. Yes. I know there was brown row scaling was still being talked right. about, and what have you. And there's something called the Goldberger Tremon relation, which, you know, with a, a linear sigma model would suggest the nucleon was going to become massless or something. Now, you have sort of different ideas about what, what happens. Yeah. And I was wondering, what would you tell somebody that wanted to understand, you know, the role of the Goldberger Tremon relation and why nucleons are going to say, follow your paradigm, which I like actually much better than, than uh, say, some of these old ones from Jerry Brown. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for the question. So a couple of comments here. So um, even in the NJL model, right, um, you can generate the consistent quark masses just from the quark condensate, right? In the NJL model, mm -hmm. consistent quark mass is just proportional to the quark condensate, right? Uh, and um, that was somewhat of the motivation, I think, also for the brown row scaling that you say, well, the row is basically two consistent quark quarks so its mass is basically two times the consistent quark mass and if the consistent quark mass goes away then the raw mass goes away mm -hmm. turns out um, that is actually not compatible with chiral symmetry to leading order and temperature the raw mass is protected so mm -hmm. it's, it's actually very hard to make that compatible uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, you know chiral perturbation theory if you wish or not even chiral perturbation theory it's it's really a car um, current algebra which protects the raw mass at order t squared so then uh, later, uh, Brown Row, I mean, Row really made arguments. Well, okay, there's this uh, higher, you know, you can have your T squared at low and at low temperatures, but at high temperatures, it's something else happening. Okay, so maybe. However, what I think uh, is more to the point is um, that uh, ultimately the the ground state masses, nucleon, Rho, um, they are not generated by the chiral condensate, but they are generated by gluon condensate. And that's actually not surprising. If you look at the trace anomaly of the uh, in, in the vacuum, um, you, you find that the nucleon, and, and take the sandwich uh, of the nucleon mass over, um, over um, the, the vacuum, it, it, it turns out that uh, um, the major part of the nucleon mass in the vacuum is actually domina is dominated by gluon, gluonic contribution. And there's a rather small contribution from from the QQ bore um, uh, uh, contribution, right? So it, so okay. Yeah. Okay. So so then when you tell somebody to say, what about the Goldberger Tremon relation? We say it's it's either accidental or really it only applies at the core. No, level, it's I, I, at the it's, I, level. Yeah, I think it's uh, it uh, it's um, 
um, it, how should I say it? It's it's maybe in 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 a, in a implementation of Carl symmetry that uh, that uh, ignores the role of the gluon condensate. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. Rob, you are the next. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate on your uh, comments, Ralph, and uh, answer uh, Scott's question in more detail. Uh, right. To be uh, brief, um, uh, brown row is excluded by all lattice data. Um, what you can understand that in terms of the Goldberger treatment relation, Scott, is there's a model with where the baryons are parity doubled. And you talked about the parity doubled by uh, Datar and Kunihiro. And for that model, you have a generalized Goldberger treatment, which is always valid. So, okay. but the Goldberger, okay. But the Goldberger yeah. treatment where you said the mass of the nucleon is proportional to G times uh, sigma and the sig sigma goes away. You know, it's, that one, that one we just should basically ignore. And the fact that it actually is sort of phenomenal. It's not sigma. It's more, it's more complicated in the parity yeah. double. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In the parity and, double. and to uh, reinforce what Ralph said, there's a part of the nucleon mass that's just inherent. It never, in the Carroll symmetric phase, it's non-zero. And okay. that's what Ralph talked about is coming from the gluon condensate. And then there's the mass splitting between the nucleon and the parity doubled partner at 1535. Yeah, the N1335. That comes from um, uh, uh, chiral symmetry breaking. Okay. But, um, so, so Goldberger treatment is sacrosanct, Brown row is dead. And um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a comment that it was clear in your results that I, I I don't understand, Ralph, and that is, you know, say the rho and A1 have to become degenerate or the nucleon may end 135, but in all cases I know of, like the lightest one barely moves and it's the heavier one that comes down. It's really interesting. It didn't have to be that way. Sorry, it didn't have to be that way? Yeah, but because like the pion and the sigma, the pion comes up a little, the sigma goes down a lot, but the pion yeah. goes up a little. But the lattice data just seems to show like the row basically just stays there. The A1 comes down. The nucleon basically stays there. The N1535 comes down. It's, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have any explanation, but it's certainly phenomenologically interesting, as you discussed, if I may say, in a very nice talk, very nice summary. Enjoyed it Thank very you. much. So, so I, would, I would go back to what you just said before about... Uh, you know, the Goldberger treatment that it has, uh, or the nucleon mass really in the vacuum, it has a contribution. The main contribution is from gluonic uh, configurations, right? And there's a small contribution for, and, and, and if that, you know, if the gluonic concept um, persists for a while, at least, you know, um, then uh, there's, you know, you could, the, the nucleon could go up, you know, that's what you're saying. I guess that's not excluded that chiral restoration would make the nucleon mass go up. Uh, do I understand correctly? Yes, but it's not indicated by the lattice. Right, right, right. But it's in principle, it would be a possibility. Yeah, but it's, um, it, and the, well, I wouldn't necessarily say the contribution from the pion is small. That's not really well constrained. In from the people, condensate, you mean? From the chiral condensate, you mean? Yeah, from these parity double models, but it does really affect, when you go out in density at low temperature, it affects the equation of state in the yeah. hadronic phase and it really affects neutron stars. Yeah. What you get for neutron stars. Yeah. So, but yeah. It, it's, yeah, but very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, <clears throat> I did have a question, another question. At some point you were trying to argue that hadronic matter near to TC is a liquid, yeah. and the reasoning for that I'm kind of arguing maybe is a little not rigorous. Okay. Uh, just from the width alone, I believe you cannot say that the uh, that the scattering rate is actually fast and actually it's a liquid. 
if you take a resonance even in the vacuum that has very wide width, it doesn't mean that this is a liquid. Right. So, so that's what I agree. And that's why I, I, I tried to say, and I obviously didn't say it clear enough, this in medium width, you should take out the vacuum width. Okay. And if I take out the vacuum width, 140 or so, you know, it's two, what, 230. That happens to be exactly the kinetic energy at that uh, point. So at 150 already, the, the, tr the true in medium contribution to the width, not the vacuum part, uh, is comparable to that. Yeah, but even that, I mean, okay. they're not kind of additive terms. This is the vacuum, this is not, because it depends on the phase space where it can decay and everything. So, for example, if the pion is decreasing or increasing in mass, maybe you would have, with the temperature, you would have a wider uh, um, uh, phase space for those decays, and basically that will explain the growth of the width again. So I would be really yeah. very careful about this. It's it's yeah. super indirect, I think. Uh, yeah, you know the pine is already pretty pretty low mass in the vacuum, so you don't get a whole lot of phase space if you would make it even lighter. And there's large contribution, uh, basically one third, one third, one third from the um, from the direct resonances of the row, right? Row <laughs> K going to K star or row N going to N star. Right. So yeah, I, I I see your point, and I you know I have no beef with that. Uh, but thank you for the comment. Right. No. But the thing is that of course you are almost surely correct that there is a continuity between quark and hadronic matter, and of course that should be the case. But somehow just relying on this argument kind of rubs me in the wrong way. <laughs> okay. No problem. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? I don't see any raised hands. I'll, I'll throw I'll throw okay. another question out of, out of Ralph because I don't get to talk to him very often. And that is, um, you go to all this trouble, beautiful work to, you know, uh, and care to take care of the uh, changes to the spectral functions. And then there are people, and I'm guilty, as, as guilty as anybody, being very lazy when it comes to the equation of state and not worrying about the fact that all you have all this, let's call it the collision broadening. And so do you think if, if you were to calculate the uh, equation of state of a hadronic gas at say 145 MeV temperature, um, that if, if, you, if you took as much care calculating the correction to the equation of state as you took taking, you know, with respect to the spectral functions that you would get a significant correction to the equation of state? That's a great question, and that's it's actually what I. Uh, it almost seems you wrote my, uh, you read my last NSF proposal. You know, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> which was good, which was good. Uh, you know, I got the funding, so. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, um, I, I even have a vision associated with that. I, my vision is that uh, the, the resonance broadening. Uh, you know, kills the hadronic degrees of freedom, so you get the onset of the turnover. Uh, toward the QGP uh, from from the broadening actually so the technologies are there I think we know how to do that it's called the Latinger Ward uh, formalism Latinger Ward Bain formalism where you can do two pi basically self consistent calculation uh, for yeah. for one and two body um, uh, correlation functions and with it calculate you know the 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 equation of state the free energy omega right. Then yeah, the it seems like it should be actually fairly straightforward, but it, but yeah, a lot it's of straight. Uh, yes and no. You know, we have done it here for the Romeson. Took us a decade. Um, now we yeah. have to do it for many other resonances. Yeah, uh, we know how to do it, but it it will be it will be a PhD project for sure, at least. Well, the lower the lower yeah. the temperature. That's why I said 145 and not 160 yeah. or something. No, I because, I was because you more, did, 160. You have every resonance in the whole particle data yeah, book. I would exactly, and I would be uh, say uh, let's say ambitious, maybe crazy, but uh, to 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 get the broadening to get the equation of state turned over. And in fact, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even mind if some of the resonances survive a while, because if I come from the QGP side, where we have done some T-matrix calculations also, uh, we see how uh, you know resonances can actually show up above TC. And my, my dream would be that there would be a top-down and um, bottom-up merging of the equation of state in, this, in, in, in much the way that uh, you know, uh, the dilepton rates did. That would be, yeah, that would be great. I, I, would, I would warn you that to be careful, because Lattice, from looking at, say, um, a baryon number fluctuations higher or it does make it suggest that there aren't really say baryons above 100 and say 55 160 yes. so 
So I, I would I would say there's yes, a that, that would, there that would on, be something uh, that one absolutely has to uh, has to um, yeah. you know that's a derivative of the equation of state and it can be done and then you can test yeah. test whether it's uh, it's uh, it's nonsense or whether uh, it still survives. Yeah, but even even if you could get it down just to say at the 140 145 MV temperature region where hadron gas is say a little rather rock solid at least in my yeah. opinion, I that's would say that would be that would be useful knowledge to know how big of a sure. How bad our you know blazy behavior is? Yes, yes. Great comment. Thanks. Good. Any other questions? Well, uh, using the opportunity, first of all, thank you all for an excellent presentation. Obviously, there is a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, and uh, the, whoever attended, uh, thank you very much.